So many artists spend their lives toiling on the road and in the studio, working their fingers to the bone and leaving their personal lives in ruin as they become a victim of their own success. That's the reason why Fish, one of the hardest working acts of our time, took an 815 day break at the turn of the century. The band toured relentlessly from their inception in 1983 until October 7, 2000, where they embarked on a hiatus that was gut-wrenching for most, if not all, of their hardcore fans. As Neil Strauss wrote on October 10th of 2000, Fish has not broken up for good, the band's management says, but it is breaking up for a while, leaving a gaping hole in the lives of thousands of fans who follow the band from city to city. No concerts are booked, new albums are scheduled, and band members plan to go their separate ways. The plan, said the group's spokeswoman, is that there is no plan. When Fish announced their return in late 2002, fans didn't know what to expect. As excited as we were, there was a fear that they may have lost something in the hiatus. But on February 28, 2003, at the tail end of their first full tour as a freshly reunited band, Fish performed an extraordinary concert in New York that included an awe-inspiring rendition of one of their most loved tunes. Hi, my name is Amara Sastry, and welcome to Anatomy of a Jam. This is the Nassau Tweezer. This is the first full performance of the song, which back in its early days was known as Tweezer So Cold. It was a collaboration between all four members, a spontaneous riff rock jam that took shape during sound checks and evolved along with the band and its diehard followers. Trey dedicated this performance to the beta intramural hockey team at Denison University as a solace for watching their season, as he said, go down in the tubes that very same day. Tweezer is a frenetic blues-based tune that combines techniques drawn from both hair metal and funk. It has been a fan favorite for nearly 30 years, as well as a vehicle for some of the band's most fiercely innovative improvisations. Here we have a classic 12-bar blues in A. We see that we have three groups of four bars that comprise the entire form, the form being this set of chords played from beginning to end and repeated for the duration of the song. One of my favorite descriptions of the 12-bar form comes from Mickey Braden. She says, a blues, especially if you deal with a 12 bar, is set up like a joke. You repeat the line twice and then you've got the punchline at the end. Let's take a look at a very literal example of this idea. Here's one of Bessie Smith's verses from Empty Bed Blues. There's one other thing he used to do. He used to cook up my cabbage. Oh, and you know he'd make it nice and hot, yeah. Mickey goes on, it's a happy music, it truly is. It's just that some of the subject matter of the blues sometimes had that sad feeling, but truly it is not a sad music. Tweezer, which is easily on the happier side of the spectrum, takes a 32 bar blues form. Here we have eight bars of the one chord, four bars of the four chord, and that section repeats twice. Then we finally get to eight bars of the five chord, which acts as that lyrical and stylistic punchline. The song starts with Trey Anastasio's iconic guitar intro. Some classic rock fans claim that Trey was inspired to write the riff after hearing Time Out by Joe Walsh. Yet Pantera fans are adamant that Anastasio ripped the lick off of Killers. The tweezer guitar riff uses all of the notes of the A minor pentatonic scale, pent meaning five and tonic meaning tones or notes. This five note scale in the key of A has the notes A, C, D, E, and G. The pentatonic scale has been found in every type of music across the globe. As Howard Goodall said in the documentary How Music Works, 
Every music system in the world shares these five notes in common. They're so fundamentally composed or performed anywhere on the planet that it seems, like our instinct for language, that they were pre-installed in us when we were born. After four to eight repetitions of the guitar intro, the rest of the band comes in. Fishman drops in with the song's signature funk beat. Page's syncopated stabs add an infectious groove underneath Trey Anastasio's guitar riff. Wynton Marsalis once said that the blues can often be characterized by the mixing of major and minor sounds. Page's major and dominant chords played over Anastasio's minor riff are what give Tweezer that indelibly bluesy sound. The real hero of this section is Mike Gordon's aggressively percussive slap bass line. Slap bass is a technique pioneered by one of the greatest electric bass players of all time, Larry Graham, on Sly and the Family Stones, Thank You for Letting Me Be Myself Again. Graham said that he had developed this technique as a child, playing in his mother's band. For unknown reasons, Miss Graham had decided to fire the band's drummer, possibly in an effort to increase the take-home pay of the remaining members. In Larry's words, I started thumping the strings with my thumb for not having the bass drum, and plucking my finger to make up for not having that backbeat on the snare drum. So it's kind of like playing drums on the bass. Perhaps a lesser bassist would just pluck this bass line, which sounds like this. Not bad, but Mike's slap technique adds heaps of attitude, which sounds like this. Mike, like Trey, restricts himself to the notes of the A minor pentatonic scale. The open notes on a four-string bass also happen to have notes that are already within the A minor scale. When the band gets to D7, the four chord, Mike and Trey take a bit of a stylistic left turn. They don't actually play chords in the traditional sense in the way that you typically hear in a blues or rock song. Rather, they play a synchronized, harmonized lick that spells out a D9 chord. This lick, the tweezer tap, gets its name from an advanced lead guitar technique popularized by Eddie Van Halen in the late 1970s. Although Eddie was not the first player to use two-handed tapping, he created a phenomenon with a stylistic approach to the technique at the end of Eruption, the first track on Van Halen's debut release. This approach was so unique that, within a few years, every lead guitar player in spandex was trying to cop it, provided they could even figure it out in the first place. It quickly became one of the defining sounds for the entire genre. As Trey told Guitar World magazine in the August 2000 issue about this tweezer tap, at the beginning of the verse section, I play a fretboard tapping lick. First, I fret an A note with my index finger, and I hammer on to a C note with my pinky. The C is bent one half step up to C sharp, and while holding the bend, I tap the same string behind the ninth fret with the middle finger of my right hand. The bend, which is executed with the left hand, is then released while the tap note is still held. Mike harmonizes this lick with a similar lick on the bass. That's our nod to the 80s. Coincidentally, Tweezer got its start on the very last night of that decade, on New Year's Eve 1989, when the band spontaneously began to compose it during soundcheck that very evening. The form of Tweezer has stayed fairly consistent over the last few decades. We have our guitar intro, then the form repeats twice, after that we have a short mini jam, and then the full jam. There are a few moments in the song before the jam officially starts that set the Nassau Tweezer apart from other versions played before or since. Two and a half minutes in, we have a massive glow stick war, which is a spontaneous ritual where the audience arcs glow sticks as a sign of celebration and excitement. This might sound pointless to the uninitiated, but a glow stick war has been known to cause an exponential boost in the energy of the room, as evidenced by the crowd's reaction. At this point, the vibe in the arena was absolutely explosive, but at four minutes, disaster strikes. 
As we enter the first break, Trey accidentally lets loose a wave of ear-piercing feedback that was so excruciating, half of the arena covered their ears out of pure reflex. The entire band even stops playing in response, albeit briefly. I'll spare you the pain of playing it in this video. I've been to hundreds of concerts in my life and I've never heard feedback that painful, particularly from a band with as much live experience as Fish. Perhaps in an effort to remain true to the document, this brutal shriek made it onto both the official soundboard released to fans after the show, as well as the remastered release. Uh, thanks, I guess? Moments later, you can hear Trey lasso his effects back in, and he makes it back just in time for the first downbeat of the main riff. <laughs> Shortly after, we get to the first jam section of Tweezer. After the band sings the final line of lyrics, look who's in the freezer, Uncle Ebenezer, they launch into a short section of improvisation that is full of tension. This mini jam is typically atonal, meaning that it lacks a tonal center or key. It is not major or minor, it is no longer in the key of A or any key for that matter. Look who's in the The tag, or the phrase that propels the band to the next section, falls on the responsibility of Fishman. He plays a drum fill that brings everyone back to the main riff. In the 22803 version, Trey purposely overshoots the landing and doesn't lock in at the same time the band does. Instead, he improvises a dazzling lick that does an exceptional job of raising the excitement in the room. This effect, which my friends and I have always called the Hadron Collider, is a bit of a magic trick. Trey loops a short phrase and then pitch bends and time shifts it gradually, giving us this beautiful and swirling quality. Five minute 25 second mark, the jam officially starts, meaning every note played from here on out is collectively improvised. They don't even know how they're going to end the song. The plan is that there is no plan. At the beginning of this jam, Fish comes in with a solid quarter note feel accentuated on his wood block. Trey immediately starts a lyrical pentatonic bass solo, starting moderately quietly and ramping up the intensity with every passing four bars. six minute 11 second mark, Page shifts his chordal approach to accent the Dorian flavor of Trey's solo. Dorian is known as the second mode of the major scale. Here we have the G major scale. And here we have the G major scale harmonized. Let's listen to the G major scale played against the one chord, the G major seven chord, which gives us the first mode known as the Ionian mode. Now let's listen to how the notes of G major sound against a backdrop of the second chord, the A minor seven chord. Let's listen once more, but this time we'll start on the note A and end on the note A to really drive home that A is our tonal center.
Improvising musicians and composers know that modes have moods, and the members of Fish are absolute masters with using these modes to weave an improvised story. Roughly 20 seconds later after Paige comes in, we have the moment that shapes the jam moving forward. It's the seed that allows the jam to blossom from a performance that is typical to good to legendary. This happens when Fishman improvises a beautifully intricate beat where he accentuates 30 second notes on his ride cymbal. Every Fish fan has a moment where they're watching the band live and realize, oh yeah, this is why the band is named after the drummer. This was that moment for 18-year-old me. seven minute 22 second mark Trey plays call and response with himself let's take a listen over the next couple minutes the band wanders This is one of the biggest struggles for non-Fish fans to understand. Most of us, when we listen to our favorite music, are used to the experience of every moment being a transcendent one. From Bob Dylan's original All Along the Watchtower to Childish Gambino's Redbone, we're used to our favorite songs being a journey where every moment matters, where every note is essential and as meaningful as the last. A Fish Jam is closer to a hike in the woods. You maybe take a path that doesn't necessarily seem attractive or exciting. But at the end of the trail, you end up on a beautiful overlook that you never would have discovered had it not been for the seemingly boring turn that you took a half mile back. The wandering that we experience in this part leads to a brief lull in the jam at the 8 minute 50 second mark, where Paige introduces his classic hovering synthesizer sound. A few seconds later, Fish drops back into his intricate ride cymbal beat, which causes an emotional shift in the jam. Fish's beat is a bit of an enigma. It's rather quiet, but it still grooves and is incredibly danceable. Although his rhythm is clear, it has a bit of a mysterious vibe that permeates the next few minutes of the jam. The note that Trey holds at the 9 minute mark is the moment where the water starts rushing through that hose. Although there's no surviving video of this performance, I remember the moment like it happened this morning. The audience could see him slow down and really center himself. He entered that moment of deep listening and he spontaneously pours out this gorgeous improvised solo that perfectly matches the dark, quiet intensity of Fish's drumbeat. Let's take a listen and pay close attention to the way Paige's lines wrap around trays like a vine creeping around an oak in an effortless natural conversation. Before this performance, I had picked up a copy of Kenny Werner's Effortless Mastery at the McGill University Bookstore. 
Trey's moment of focus directly reminded me of a quote from the book, where the author is talking about improvising music while in an egoless, meditative state of mind, which he calls the inner space. The inner space is the place where joy, pleasure, and fulfillment, worldly and otherwise, are available in unlimited supply. Acceptance of these gifts allows the flow to increase. Performances given from the state are said to be greatly inspired, leaving their audiences profoundly moved. A concert given by a performer who has attained the state is regarded as an event not to be missed. When Miles Davis approached the microphone, he focused himself into that space before playing the first note. There would frequently be long silences between his phrases. In that time, you could see and feel him recentering himself. That's very rare in musicians today. That practice has the paradoxical effect of heightening people's awareness and increasing the intensity of the moment. Warner continues, the highest state a musician can be in is a selfless state. Just as a riverbed receives the great waters, we receive inspiring ideas. For many, becoming such a channel is little more than a myth or wishful thinking. Artists often have trouble getting out of their own way, and they must therefore struggle. They are often swept away by a river of mental and emotional activity. They are drowning in feelings of inferiority, inadequacy, and anxiety. The battle is mistaken for a holy war and romanticized. But the struggle is simply with their ego. When I asked people which musician first attracted them to music, they often mentioned one who transcended these limitations. In the hands of such people, music has the potential of changing lives. Even when novices go to their concerts, they feel something opening inside. Fish have their own terminology for their state of egoless improvisation called the hose. This idea took shape when the band was opening for Santana in the summer of 1992. Two years later, in an interview with NPR, Trey said, We actually have exercises that we do, where we work on improving our improvising as a group. It gets rid of the ego. It's an exercise to get rid of the ego. And the more that we do it, the more we find out that our improvisations are less concerned with showing off flashy solos or whatever, and more concerned with making a group sound. There's a feeling that we always talk about. When we went out with Santana, he had brought up this thing about the hose where the music is like water rushing through you and as a musician, your function is really like that of a hose. And well, his thing is that the audience is like a sea of flowers and you're watering the audience. But the concept of music going through you that you're not actually creating it and what you're doing is, the best thing you could do is get out of the way. So when you're in a room full of people, there's this kind of group vibe that seems to get rolling. Although this jam is just getting started, we have a bit of a conflict. Trey steps on his wah pedal in a frantic manner, which is sometimes a signal that a jam may be ending its course. Fish hears that and responds by hitting his China Crash symbol, which we've heard him use as a OK, wrap it up B signal. Trey decides to keep going and superimposes a new chord progression by playing A minor, G, and D. Perhaps this was in an effort to shift the jam into a new harmony, or perhaps it was just a cool sound that he wanted to explore. Regardless of these clashes, they collectively decide to keep the jam going, perhaps mostly due to Trey's insistence. We have a few more seconds of wandering as the band collectively finds ideas and searches. Around the 12 minute 40 second mark, Trey catches feedback and holds a D chord, allowing for another one of those centering moments where the hose starts to rear its psychedelic head. As Trey holds this chord, we hear Paige improvising using a D major sound. Now we can hear the jam start to turn type 2. This tweezer jam started in an A Dorian mode, and we see the band shifting to the key of D based on Trey's chords and Paige's lines. Trey starts repeating a D major arpeggio followed by a G major arpeggio, hinting a harmonic shift to a new progression involving the chords D and G. 
There's no question that the other members can hear this change, but they don't jump to address the chords instantly. Let's listen as the band adopts a slow burn approach and takes their time in addressing Trey's implied chords. They patiently develop their harmonic backdrop as Trey digitally pitch bends his notes up into the stratosphere, giving way to a euphoric crest propelled by Fish's delicate breakbeats. This peak starts to peter out around the 16 minute 22 second mark and seems like it could end right there. Trey comes in with another beautiful lick and keeps the jam going. Fish drops in and out of double time at the 17 minute 16 second mark as the band has ditched the 
D and G progression and decides to weave back and forth between D Mixolydian and D Dorian, driven by Page's harmony and Trey's lines. Fish collectively groove and wander until they find themselves in a syncopated circular funk groove initiated by Fishman around the 19 minute mark. Listen to how Trey plays in an effort to copy the drums and completely nails it. Fish then continues to hop in and out of double time as the rest of the band grooves along with him. The band searches and wanders some more until Trey starts playing the chords D, F, G, and back to D. In the key of D, this is a 1, flat 3, 4, 1 progression. Before, we saw that Trey gently played arpeggios and allowed the band to catch up with him and develop a new harmony. Here, he throws finesse out the window and becomes a power chord caveman that beats everyone over the head with this new progression. Trey then rips through blues licks as the band sails through the last of the jam's peaks. The signal to wind it down also comes from Trey, who digitally bends between the root and flat 7th, the notes D and C, to let the rest of the band know that it's time to land the plane.
Although the jam is over, the band isn't done improvising, as we watch them spend the next few minutes splattering paint onto their canvas. Trey leaves us with a pitch-bended loop, slowly decaying into oblivion, as the audience is left speechless in its wake. When I walked out of Nassau Coliseum on the night of February 28, 2003, something in me had changed. As Kenny Werner said, a peak musical experience can positively alter the way you see the world, and that's exactly what Fish did for me that day. I felt like I had been let in on some big cosmic secret after having lived 18 years in darkness, a slave to a mind languishing on autopilot. After that performance, I learned that every moment, regardless of your past, is an opportunity to completely reinvent yourself and that the answer is always in front of us, around us, or more often than not, within us. We just have to close our eyes and listen.